The question posed in the title of this video might just be the most fascinating thing you can ask about the Witcher trilogy, and it even being a question is a part of what makes these games so unique. When we step into the role of Geralt, we aren't putting ourselves in control of a generic blank slate. No, we're playing as Geralt of Rivia, a character with thousands of pages and many moments in the game's worth of established behavior. Despite that, we the players are still able to make a ton of decisions as this character. But one of the most interesting questions to try and answer is, what would Geralt actually do in those moments? So today, I'm going to dive headfirst into that premise, starting with The Witcher 2 and every major decision you'll make within it. I'm not just covering the big 7 or 8 main quest choices you'll see on a checklist, I'm also including much of the incredible side content. The Witcher 2 absolutely nails the concept of choices that have no perfect fairy tale outcomes, which is only fitting for this world, and that lack of black and white choices and consequences makes this all the more interesting. Now I should mention, yes, Geralt is still partially suffering from his amnesia during the events of The Witcher 2, but it's very clear that his personality and core values are still intact. What's equally as important to point out is that much of Geralt's behavior in The Witcher 2 specifically has nothing to do with you. Yes, very important decisions are thrown into your hands, especially in the first and third act, but most of Geralt's actions and even most conversations are just Geralt doing his own thing. Many big events are extended cutscenes or linear gameplay sections where you see how Geralt behaves. Even in many, arguably most, conversations, you don't get much of a say in how things go other than the order you're choosing options, and that information gives you a great idea as to who Geralt is at this point in time. One final thing, this is what would Geralt do. It's not meant to be what you should have done, in fact for about 40% of these my first time choices don't match up at all with where this video goes because I was either missing proper context or wanted to see how certain things would play out. It's just a really interesting concept, and I'm not claiming this is some definitive piece of analysis, but I had a lot of fun making this video and if you guys enjoy this one, it's something I could potentially extend to The Witcher 3. Okay, I'm gonna start with the prologue area and move forward from there. There are two major choices within the prologue that introduce you to the concept of your actions having major consequences you won't actually see for some time. The first impactful decision is optional, but takes place immediately after the opening scene of the game when you leave Triss and exit your tent. You'll come across the Crinfrid Reavers, a group of mercenaries, two of which Geralt had met previously, although he doesn't remember. The new guy, New Boy is his name, has accepted a bet to head into battle wearing no armor. The Reavers had come across a magic amulet they think will protect him in his armor's place so they're hoping this bet will make them rich. If you ask for more information on the amulet's origin, it becomes clear that Geralt has realized something isn't quite right. The amulet's magic for certain, though it failed to protect the shrine from your patrolling. At this point, you can offer some advice. Either tell him to head into battle wearing no armor, or be upfront about your suspicions. If you tell him to trust the amulet, you'll find him dead once you've escaped the dungeons after the battle. The young reaver of Crinfrid. A lot of good that amulet did him. However, I definitely think Geralt would tell this new recruit to wear his armor and not trust some sketchy amulet. If you do, he lives and helps you sneak past the guard where you'd otherwise find him dead. By the way, if you take the amulet yourself, which you can loot from his corpse or get directly from the Reavers as a thank you for your advice, you later find out that it is indeed cursed. While carrying the amulet, you take more damage. And through a fairly lengthy process, you can cleanse it to remove that penalty and increase your health regeneration. Melitele's heart can once again bring luck. Okay, next is the first major decision you'll make in The Witcher 2, and it's one that has consequences that carry into The Witcher 3. While attempting to siege the castle, Fulltest, Geralt, and the other Temerians run into Arian Lavalette, the son of Mary Louisa, a woman who also happens to be the mother of Fulltest's youngest son and daughter. Now, it's important to note that at this point, Fulltest is hoping to somewhat patch things up with Mary Louisa once the dust has settled. I'm certain Louisa will realize her mistakes. Besides, children should have a mother. These two children are the whole reason this castle is being sieged to begin with. Anyway, Arian is defending the castle from Fulltest's forces. While Fulltest would prefer he'd surrender, he really just wants him out of the way. And Geralt offers to sneak in and try to get them through while avoiding a bloodbath. I'll try to reason with him. Once you've made your way up to Arian, you have two options. Convince him to surrender or just kill him and all of his men. This one is an easy call. Geralt would definitely spare Arian. It's just the easy choice from his perspective on every single count. For one, Geralt lays out his intentions to try and reason with Arian to full test. And if you even attempt to, Arian folds very easily. And it's clear his main concern is just his mother's safety. Should anything happen to my mother, I shall find you and kill you. Making the choice to spare him also prevents a ton of needless risk and death. I mean, if you decide to just attack, you not only have to kill Arian, but all of his men. 
In gameplay, Geralt is a god of course, but realistically, Arian plus a dozen of his men are a major threat to Geralt, and he takes no joy in killing soldiers anyway. There's no harm in trying to talk sense into him, it's the much easier task, and it's at least worth a shot. Also, as I mentioned, Foltest would prefer Arian doesn't die. He doesn't care about Arian, but if Foltest had lived, Arian's death definitely would have made making up with the mother of two of his children a bit more difficult. Foltest is the one sieging the castle after all, so the death of her other son would realistically be on him. I've personally never tried to patch things up with a woman after being responsible for the death of her son, but I feel like that would be a tough sell. I'm not as charismatic as Foltest though, so who knows, maybe he could have pulled it off. Anyway, if you spare Arian, you later help each other through the dungeons after Geralt is accused of killing Foltest because of Letho's antics, that rascal. You part ways with Arian while he apparently goes out in a blaze of glory. Much later, you find out that he actually survived this, which was a shock on my first playthrough. The last time we saw each other, you had locked yourself in a cellar full of oil that you had set on fire. I grew up wandering the nooks and corners of that fortress, Witcher. I know passages even the mice have not heard of. Okay, it's almost time to move on to Flotsam, possibly my favorite area in the entire Witcher trilogy and one that is full of difficult choices. I'm going to start with Witcher contracts and small side quests before moving into the three major main quest decisions you'll make during Act 1. Let's start with the Flotsam experiment. This one is very simple and also sort of carries over to The Witcher 3. You run into a pair of alchemists who want you to take some mystery substance they've created. They won't give you any details about what it is, but when you first walk up to them, they're talking about you like you're a guinea pig. They also want Geralt to travel to them in Vizima after one year so they can examine him further. You can either accept the mystery substance or tell them to take a hike. We need to study its long-term effects. We can't say more. Are you in? No way. This is one where I took the substance in my first playthrough because I was curious, but Geralt would likely tell them to screw off. I mean, put yourself in his place. These two guys you just met want you to take something they won't give you any information about as part of their little experiment, and then they want you to visit them after a year so they can study you further. Geralt simply would want no part of this. That's not to say that actually taking it ends up being bad. The Witcher 2 is full of good decisions in the moment that have awful consequences later, and the opposite is also very true. In the case of this potion, taking it just has no consequences, as when Geralt is later asked if he's experiencing any side effects, his only comment is definitely a sarcastic one. Or peculiar interactions with other potions? Yeah, every time I mix it with vodka, my tongue gets hairy. In The Witcher 3, if you took the potion, you find a note from one of these guys. It was written just after you meet them, and claims the potion had the potential to reverse Geralt's inability to have children, although nothing ever comes of that, at least nothing we see. Okay, let's move on to the Troll Under the Bridge quest. A drunken troll guarding a nearby bridge has a contract on its head issued from Louis Merce, a shady character you later find out is involved with drug trafficking in Flotsam. Apparently this troll is demanding alcohol from those trying to cross, and is also no longer doing his long-standing job of maintaining the bridge. The residents of Lavendin, a small village near the bridge just outside of Flotsam, want you to spare the troll, as apparently he did a great job keeping the bridge in shape for many years before he recently started drinking heavily. The village elder will agree to pay you four times the original contract price if you agree to help the troll get over whatever his problem is instead of killing him. Once you finally visit the troll himself, he is indeed very drunk. Give vodka, dwarf. You drink too much. Your eyesight's shit. After a bit of what I'll generously call conversation, you get in a little fight before he surrenders. Enough! Don't hit! I'd be good! You then find out that his wife had been murdered, which has this troll feeling bummed out. Miss it on bridge. Go home. No meat smell. Woman dead? Had no head. At this point, you can come to an agreement. You'll find his wife's killers if he agrees to stop drinking and fix the bridge once you've done so. You can also choose to kill the troll here if you're feeling extremely sadistic, but this one is pretty definitive. Geralt absolutely would not. I mean, for one, Geralt doesn't kill intelligent creatures unless it's absolutely necessary. If they're an active threat killing innocents, sure, but otherwise, no. This troll in particular has done nothing wrong whatsoever. His wife was murdered, so he's hitting the bottle and not maintaining the bridge. His only crime, according to those who want him dead, is that to pay the troll toll, you gotta give him liquor instead of the usual scraps. Beyond that, Geralt stands to gain 200 crowns for helping the troll out, which he would anyway, compared to just 50 for murdering the poor guy. His wife's killer can also be found pretty easily, it doesn't take much at all to fix the problem the right way. The culprit is a poacher named Dimitri, 
who will more or less immediately attack you when you try to approach him. The troll sends his regards. Kill him! No witnesses! After all this, the troll feels better and agrees to stop drinking so he can get back to maintaining the bridge. No drink more. Head in peace. By the way, during the standard progression of the troll quest, you'll run into a guy with the head of the troll's wife on his wall. He purchased it from the poacher. If you've beaten everyone else in Flotsam at dice poker at this point, you get the option to play him for the head, and if you win, you can take it and give it back to the bridge troll, which is kind of disturbing even though he's thankful. I found your wife's head. My woman, I not forget. I give reward. Okay, let's move on to the quest Malena. You come across a she-elf being accused of luring Flotsam guards into a nearby cave and killing them. The she-elf claims she only spoke to the missing guards somewhat near the cave before they disappeared, and the accusers don't have any solid evidence other than her being the last individual each missing guard was seen with. Geralt suggests inspecting the cave for evidence, and when the guards say there are monsters lurking inside, he offers to do it himself for a price, and the guards immediately agree because they want to get to the bottom of this. To make a long story short, you find the missing men riddled with Scoia'tael arrows, which isn't exactly something cave monsters would have done. Scoia'tael arrows. This is pretty clear. At this point, you return to the soldiers and have two options. Lie completely and say the men were killed by monsters, or tell the truth and see what the she-elf has to say for herself. Geralt has no real incentive to lie here. Yes, non-humans are treated very poorly in Flotsam, it's horrible, but this particular she-elf is likely killing Flotsam guards who are just doing their job. And the only way to get the truth is to say what you actually found and then let her speak, which you can give her a chance to do. At any rate, if you do lie, she offers to meet you near a waterfall outside of Flotsam under the pretense of engaging in Geralt's favorite activity. And if you actually do meet with her despite all the red flags, guess what? She betrays you. I really did lure those two guards into a trap. I know. I found the arrows. Exactly. You know too much. And only corpses keep their secrets. Huge shocker, I know. You then have to butcher about a dozen Scoia'tael, plus you end up right back where you started with virtually the same decision from before once you track Malena down again. Although you can just kill her yourself at that point. You deserve to die. Anyway, let's back way up because I don't think Geralt would lie for Malena to begin with. If you don't lie and then give her a chance to speak, as that's another decision you have to make, she claims there's more to the story, but very suspiciously, she wants you to follow her into an area in Scoia'tael territory to see for yourself. It's very obvious that this is a desperate attempt at an ambush. I mean, you literally just found the corpses of men she lured into a cave, their bodies riddled with her arrows. If you actually follow her, guess what? It's an ambush. I know, it's a betrayal you never could have seen coming. What Geralt would do here, by my best take on the situation, is give Milena a chance to speak after telling the truth about what he found in the caves, but once she suggests heading into Scoia'tael territory to see some mysterious evidence she won't tell you about, he'd draw the line and leave the situation there. Geralt did all he could, this elf is guilty as hell, and at that point, why would he willingly walk into an ambush? I know for a fact that I did not do it this way on my first playthrough, I was too curious and thought things might be headed in a different direction between Geralt and this elf, but thankfully Geralt is smarter than me, and not only that, he's gambling with his life, whereas all I had to do was load an earlier save. Okay, time to switch to a fairly small quest called The Scent of Incense. On the docks of Flotsam, you're beckoned over by a man named Vencel, and it's immediately apparent that this guy is fairly shady. He claims that a local shop owner is selling a specific type of incense that is both extremely popular and harmful. He wants the formula for himself and offers to pay you to get it. If you look into this situation, you'll find a mob of angry locals outside the incense shop. And if you speak to them, they also seem to think that whatever this guy is selling is bad news. You've got to do something about that filthy business. The crook selling the poison is going unpunished. Once you speak to the shop owner, he'll try to convince you to take a fake formula and give that to Vencel to fool him. There's no real reason to take him up on this without getting the full story, and if you've spoken to the locals, you can easily get him to tell you the truth by either threatening him a bit or simply using Axie. He confesses that while what he's selling isn't actually Fistech, he's aware of the horrible effect it's having on people. If you even mention alerting authorities, he immediately gets scared because he knows what he's doing is wrong, and he not only hands over the formula, but decides to close up his shop entirely. The same thing happens if you guilt trip him a bit. You've lived with these people since childhood. Why would you want to poison them? You're right, Witcher. Before you close up, why don't you give me the formula for that incense? Now, you get a reward from the locals for doing this, but here's the real question. What do you do with Vencel? 
My take on the right thing to do here morally, and what I think Geralt would do, is get the real formula from the shopkeeper, and then not give it to Vencel at all. It's very apparent that this guy's reason for wanting the formula isn't a selfless one, and sure enough, if you give it to him whether you accepted the offer for a fake or got the real one, you find out that Vencel and his men are not only drug dealers, but are also remnants of the Salamandra, the big bads from The Witcher 1. Salamandra stragglers in flotsam. Who would have thunk? By the way, a cool little detail I'd never noticed before is that if you speak to Vencel and specifically tell him you won't be handing over the formula, in cartoon villain fashion he says you'll meet again. And sure enough, if you venture deep into the forest, you'll run into a little in-game event where he and his men try to ambush you. I told you we'd meet again, white-haired one. Grab him! So, I suppose it's time to talk about In the Claws of Madness. This is one of the most disturbing quests in the entire Witcher trilogy, and in true Witcher fashion, there's no wonderful sunshine and rainbow conclusion to be found. You come across the ruins of an insane asylum. A man outside claims that he and his partner were ever so innocently searching for rare herbs inside the ruin, when something trapped his friend below. To summarize what happens next, I'll make a long story fairly short, and keep in mind, this is one of the most complex side quests in the entire trilogy. The story you were given is a complete fabrication, there was no actual rare herb searching going on, which I know probably comes as a shock. This guy and his partner, who you later find, are degenerate former field medics who used to work at this asylum an asylum where the patients were tortured and experimented on. One day, a Nilfgaardian was captured and brought there, and in his desperate plea for freedom, he claimed to know where a local treasure was hidden. These two and others who worked there began to treat the patients even more brutally, as they thought they'd soon be rich and no longer in need of a job. Once they'd taken the information needed from the Nilfgaardian, their commander had him quartered in front of the other tormented patients. A riot and fire broke out, and these two, along with their commander, cut down almost everyone. The only surviving patient, a woman, was captured and treated just how you'd expect for a couple of days before she ultimately escaped. Two nights later, she slit our commander's throat and that was all we saw of her, and of the map, of course. This woman they mention is the mother of Laredo, the town commandant, and these two pathetic morons are back after all these years trying to find her and the treasure. Problem is, the asylum is now haunted by the spirit of the tortured and quartered Nilfgaardian, he wants revenge, the lives of these two, who were stupid enough to return. Bring me their eyes so I may spit in them before they are forever extinguished. At this point, you're met with a decision, one of which splits off into another choice. You need to lift this curse, but how are you going to do it? The first option is simply tricking the men, bringing both to the vengeful spirit, and allowing them to be tortured and then burned alive. Is this satisfying? Yes. Is it what I did on my first playthrough? Yes. Do they deserve it? Yeah, probably. That said, I don't think this is the route Geralt would go, but justice can still be served. Your other option at this point is to lift the curse by tricking the spirit, which is done using some animal parts. He buys it, curse is lifted, and you're good to go there. You're then met with another decision. Do you let these degenerates walk away, or do you turn them in? What I think is the best, not perfect, but best decision from Geralt's perspective, is turning these guys in, and it's the most satisfying form of justice here, as who is there to greet them but the woman they tormented all those years ago. We should talk about the good old days. It's not perfect, Lorito and his mother are also horrible people, but things are rarely perfect in the Witcher universe, and realistically, this is one of the toughest choices, morally at least, in the entire game. It's a very complex quest, and I found it hard to sum it all up in a not completely confusing way, so hopefully I did an okay job. That does take care of all flotsam side quests with meaningful decisions, so now we need to tackle the three major main quest choices you'll be making during Act 1. By the way, this is as good of a time as any to mention that the romance stuff is not going to be given the what would Geralt do treatment. I think you can all understand where those choices, and I'm using big air quotes right now, really don't fit what I'm trying to do with this video and would just be cringeworthy and a waste of time to even try and include. With that out of the way, let's get to Roach, Yorveth, and the major main quest choices you'll make in the first act. The first is really tough, that being whether you give Yorveth his sword back or not after he helps you meet up with Letho. Now keep in mind, this is not the final Roach slash Yorveth decision that determines much of the rest of your game. That comes just after this. So, Yorveth agrees to pretend to be captured so you can approach the Kingslayer. Letho wants the elf dead, and going up to him with Yorveth captured is a good way to hear the truth and distract him as Yorveth has his commandos lying in wait so you can capture him together. To jump forward after the first stage of the ruse, Letho and Geralt finish their conversation, and Yorveth's elves jump in to take Letho down. 
Unfortunately, Roach and his men also attack at this point, killing several Scoia'tael and utterly destroying your plan. It turns out Roach had Vest tailing you and decided to get in the middle of it because he didn't know what you were up to. It's at this point you have to make a choice. Punch Yorveth and leave him defenseless while you fight Letho, or give him back the sword he surrendered to you for the ruse. It's a split second decision you have to make, and I promise you I am not biased towards Yorveth or Roach. I love both, each of them are in my top 10 Witcher characters of all time, but I'm trying to look at this from Geralt's perspective. I think either choice is viable, I could absolutely see Geralt going either way, but that's a cop out, so I'm going to say that in the moment, heat of the battle, Geralt gives Yorveth his sword back. It just feels wrong to leave him defenseless in the scenario after he helped you and is only in that situation because of you. Several of his commandos are dead and you don't really know what's going on with Roach other than he clearly was spying on you in some capacity. Also, your concern at the moment is Letho and getting after him as soon as possible. This is the first major timed choice, Geralt doesn't have many seconds to think about making it, and in the heat of the situation plus the surprise of Roach and his men taking out half of Yorva's commandos just as you were about to get the Kingslayer, I personally wouldn't lean towards Geralt punching Yorva's lights out before going after your real target. Now, as I mentioned, that choice is not what determines the path you take, although it does have a big effect on how this next decision plays out. You fight Letho, and after he defeats you, which is impossible to avoid, he tells you he'll be forcing Triss to open a portal and teleport them to Edern, which, as you find out, he successfully does. It's at this point where Geralt's priorities completely change. Yes, he still wants to clear his name and find Letho, but getting to Triss as soon as possible becomes Geralt's focus in the moment. So, you're directed to speak to Roach and Yorveth. Roach is mad at you if you gave the elf his sword back, but either way, he refuses to leave until he's completed a planned attack on Lorito's base. One of King Henselt's spies is living in Lorito's house and has bribed the Commandant to support Kedwin in the event of a conflict. Roach wants to get to this spy and interrogate him, and he also plans to kill Lorito in the process if he's around. It's a risky and time-consuming affair. Roach, we have to sail. We need to get to Edern. I'm not leaving until I deal with Lorito. This plan is likely good for Flotsam, but bad for Triss. In Geralt's mind at least, you don't have time to lose, which he says himself. Now, where Yorveth is depends entirely on whether you gave him back his sword. If you didn't, he's locked up on a prison barge, and if you want to leave Flotsam with him, you first need to break the elf out. On the other hand, if you returned his weapon, Yorveth is free and wants to leave immediately. I set Geralt down the path of giving Yorveth's sword back, and in that scenario, choosing Yorveth here is what I think Geralt would do, but only in this situation. His priority is getting to Triss, and Geralt could use some backup. Zoltan is also already with Yorveth, which is nice, and the elf wants to leave right away and also has a plan. Your priorities just happen to align in that moment. Roach, on the other hand, wants to track down a spy and take out Lorito before leaving, an operation that takes time Geralt doesn't really have. In this situation where you gave Yorveth his sword, which I think Geralt would, going with him is what I believe Geralt would do, and if you commit to this scenario, Geralt will later lay out exactly why he made that decision in an optional conversation with Dandelion. One thing's for sure, Letho's not on this side of the fog. If you wanted to pursue the assassin, you should have gone to Henselt's camp with Roach. Just because I went after Triss doesn't mean I've forgotten about Letho. I will say, if you did punch Yorveth out, taking Roach's path makes much more sense, because at that point your options are either breaking Yorveth out of prison to escape with him, or just going along with Roach's plan to get to Henselt's spy and maybe take Lorito out in the process, which is a net good even if it's not a priority. Both things take time, and at that point Yorveth has no goodwill towards you, so Roach makes much more sense. By the way, I am going to cover decisions on both the Yorveth and Roach paths, so don't worry, but let's get back to the Yorveth situation for now. The final big moral decision in Flotsam, of which there isn't an equivalent choice on Roach's side of things, happens just after you commandeer the prison barge to head to Edern. Unfortunately, and kind of ironically, helping Yorveth and the Scoia'tael makes the situation for non-humans in Flotsam much worse. There are different awful consequences for choices you'll make with Roach, there's no perfect way to play things out, but as you're sailing away alongside your new elf buddy, Lorito threatens to burn a building full of female elven civilians alive. After realizing what's about to happen, Geralt will always jump off the barge to help. But I'm not prepared to let murder happen. I'm going ashore. Now at this point you're presented with a choice, and I really do think this one is a no-brainer. You can either rescue the burning elves because Lorito sets the building on fire no matter what, or you can let them burn and run after him. I simply do not see a scenario where Geralt lets the women burn. 
It does suck that Laredo gets away when things play out this way, but Geralt isn't thinking about the greater good when he's running past a building full of burning innocents. The idea of the greater good versus what's right in the moment is part of what makes this thought experiment, what would Geralt do, so fascinating. That's it for Flotsam though, I think this is already my longest video ever, and I'm just wrapping up Act 1. I hope you're enjoying it, let's continue. So, since the Geralt choices I've landed on take us down Yorvith's path, I'll start with those Act 2 decisions and then I'll cover the Roach stuff because I want to hit those as well. It is worth pointing out that Act 2 has far less room for major story detours, not to mention that it has significantly less side content than Act 1. Because of that, there are far fewer impactful decisions, but between the Roach and Yorvith path there are more than enough. We'll start with a Witcher contract called With Flickering Heart. Now, depending on how thorough you are in completing this one, the decision you make at the end changes from what is a very difficult choice to something else entirely. One of Yorvith's commandos, Elias, wants Geralt's help in getting to the bottom of a series of disappearances. Young elven and human men have apparently been vanishing and later turning up dead. His story and general attitude is immediately very suspicious. I need to see the corpses. They're all buried. Where? Beneath a mound in the forest behind Vergen, but you shouldn't go there. If you investigate the two leads you're given by this elf, searching a burned village where the bodies were found, and an autopsy on one specific recovered corpse in the catacombs, virtually all evidence will point towards the culprit being a succubus. Something worth mentioning is that while performing the autopsy, Geralt notices a metal splinter from a weapon of some sort lodged in the victim's arm. There's something embedded in the bone. I can't extract that without special tools. You then have to seek those tools out if you want to do anything about it. A metal splinter. Interesting. Now, whether you've extracted the metal splinter or not, you then need to use Dandelion to help you lure the succubus from her lair in the burned village. He'll sing her a sonnet, and once she's invited him in, he can either get Geralt for help or head inside. I got him into this mess. I'd better get the fool out. If Dandelion goes inside, the succubus won't harm him, and either way, she'll make a claim that Elias is guilty of the murders, not her. Did he show you the victim's bodies? He told me they were buried. <laughs> By him. Yet he massacred the corpses first to make it seem as if beasts had attacked the poor souls. You can kill her right here or try to be more thorough in your investigation, which I fully think Geralt would do. If you confront Elias, he denies the murders but admits he lied to you on multiple occasions. He has associated with the succubus in the past, he even admits that he loves her, and of course he also knew what he was doing sending Geralt into this from the start. He initially claimed he didn't know why or how men were disappearing. Now it's time for the real decision you have to make. Bring your suspicions about Elias to Yorvith, his commander, or kill the succubus without any concrete evidence. That's the real choice you're making here. From Geralt's perspective, it's not kill the succubus or kill Elias, which is how I see this quest framed pretty often. To me, it's a certainty that Geralt would at least further his investigation, because at this point, the guilt of the succubus is very much up in the air. Now, if you don't have the weapon splinter, going to Yorvith is kind of useless, because there's no evidence other than your hunch and the word of the succubus. Your Scoyatel, Elias, is murdering people from Vergen. Any proof? Elias is one of my best warriors. No. Come back when you have some. Let's assume Geralt is a diligent witcher who went back for the weapon piece, and in that case, if you bring your suspicions to Yorvith, the rest is kind of taken out of your hands. Yorvith will take the piece and look into it, and whatever he finds convinces him that Elias is 100% guilty. Elias must have learned that I know the truth about his madness. You never get details on what exactly convinced him. I guess the fragment was matched to Elias's weapon, and that was enough. Or maybe there's more to it, but it doesn't really matter, because Elias fled the city the second he found out Yorvith was looking into him. At this point, if you return to the succubus lair, he'll be lying in wait to try and kill you. I'll not be put down like some dog! Fight! You're then forced to take him out, so any choice here is taken out of your hands. The real decision you had to make was whether to thoroughly investigate and air out your suspicions, or kill the succubus on very shaky ground. After you present your suspicions and potential evidence to Yorvith, you can no longer kill the succubus, and I don't really see a point before that where Geralt would feel he has enough evidence to cut her down. Elias seals his own fate by fleeing and attempting to kill Geralt, and what exactly is Geralt supposed to do about that? Keep in mind, while I do think the succubus is innocent, part of the beauty of several Witcher quests is that you don't know for sure. What I am sure of is that Geralt would thoroughly investigate the matter, and Elias signing his own death warrant because of that thoroughness is not Geralt's problem. Are you crazy? You want to see a hoofed hag ride me to death? On the other hand, 
We all have to die of something. Believe it or not, it's already time to move on to main quest material because there are really no other meaningful side quest decisions you'll make in Vergen, other than one fully optional choice that I'm going to tie into the only big Act 2 decision in just a minute. Before I get to that big choice I mentioned, I should at least acknowledge the trolls of Vergen. There's a husband and wife troll you can meet in various situations depending on which path you took. But even though I had written out a whole section for each of the four encounters at one point, I decided to cut it way down. These two trolls are very nice regardless of when you meet them, and while you can kill them, Geralt definitely wouldn't. Beyond the fact that there's really no reason to if you're paying attention, the situation isn't ever even really framed as kill or spare. Like on Roach's Path, one of them will only attack you if you tell them you killed their partner. That's the only way the troll can even die, which already requires you to make an earlier choice Geralt wouldn't. It just felt like filler to break down four very similar situations when the answer was the same every single time. Good to chat. No harm in talking, see? <sighs> Sleep I. Run out go. Sweet dreams. Okay, let's talk about the Prince of Edern, Stennis, and his potential lynching. Despite the possible lynching he can go through, I can confidently say that Stennis is an underhated character in the Witcher community. He's annoying, condescending, and all around just difficult to stomach, and I rarely see anyone talking about that. That aside, I'm not biased at all, does he deserve to get lynched? If you haven't played The Witcher 2 or need a refresh on the situation, a very important character named Saskia is poisoned via tainted wine at the beginning of Act 2 on the Yorvith Path. Philippa saves her from death, but she falls into a deep coma, and who poisoned her is a mystery. After a little progression through the main quest in this city, the townsfolk will get sick of waiting for an answer and accuse Stennis, as one of Saskia's servants has been spreading a rumor that the prince was responsible. The peasants want him dead, and they've gathered outside his quarters, where you'll also find others who support the prince and want any violence to be stopped. It's up to you to investigate the matter in a very limited amount of time. You won't have time to talk to everyone, though, that's for sure. So, in the interest of simplifying this very complex situation, let's assume Geralt follows the best possible threads for concrete evidence. You can only speak to a limited number of the gathered groups before the mob will have enough and force you to make a judgment call. The two most important conversations you need to have include one with this dwarf who crafted Saskia's favorite goblet, and you also need to speak to this set of peasants. Each will trigger a short mini-quest that, depending on how you approach them, can offer some actual useful evidence. To start with the peasants, they know the servant of Saskia who's been spreading the rumors of Stennis' guilt. They give up his location, and once you track the guy down, through the power of Axie you can get him to tell you everything he knows. This servant overheard a priest named Olcan telling Stennis that Saskia was a beast under her fair skin, which is a wonderful little line on a second playthrough considering you eventually discover that Saskia is actually a dragon. I don't think the priest actually knew that, and Saskia is as good of a person as you'll find in the Witcher universe, but it's a clever little bit of foreshadowing nonetheless. Anyway, this servant then overheard the priest request that Stennis clear out the kitchen of any servants, but unfortunately, he didn't hear what Stennis had to say in response. The extra little snag in your investigation at this point is the fact that the priest you'd like to speak to is no longer among the living. <laughs> Fortunately, this guy lived in Vergen, so you can try to search his home for evidence. Once you find it, you'll discover a diagram for a fake goblet identical to Saskia's favorite. It's pretty incriminating, I mean, what are these plans doing in Olcan's home if they're not his? But unfortunately, he's no longer around to question. Searching his room ends this little mini-quest, and you're now left with the lead you got from this dwarf. He created Saskia's original goblet she'd been using for years, not the fake. And if you ask whether a replica goblet could have been made, he points you towards a specific craftsman he clearly doesn't think highly of. He's not produced one decent vessel. They all look like the work of a drunken elf. Thorax, his name. Now here's the big problem, and I feel like I need to lay out just how ridiculous it is to get all the proper evidence you'll need for Geralt to make a somewhat informed decision about Stennis. This second mini-quest surrounding the possible counterfeit goblet is heavily dependent on you just having happened to have completed several different tiers of almost completely unrelated questing. Going into the Stennis investigation, there's no way you'd know any of this was going to have an effect on you getting proper evidence. So, what exactly am I talking about? Well, the creator of the original goblet tells you to speak to this dwarf, Thorak. The problem is, this guy needs to be dead in order for you to properly complete this investigation mini-quest, and you killing him has nothing to do with this investigation. There's a very long series of events that are almost entirely unrelated that lead to this dwarf already being dead once the Stennis situation goes down. You need to have stumbled upon a magic dream crystal near the Vergen Catacombs, and then have taken that to Philippa. 
She'll tell you that a dream crystal would be a great part of the cure for Saskia, but the one you have isn't strong enough, and you need to access a local quarry where more can be found. So you then need to use the information you get from the crystal, which Geralt sees but you don't, to blackmail the town alderman Cecil. It was his dream crystal, and it revealed his dark, dark secret, which is a funny little bit that the game never really tells you outright. The dirt you have on him is that he doesn't drink, which is apparently such a shameful thing among dwarves that it getting out would destroy Vergen's morale. Who knows? Maybe you'd keep your office, but you'd be the talk of the town for ages. And your nephew? Poor kid. You use this sickening information to blackmail him into opening a gate, and I promise this is all still related to the Stennis investigation. Once past the gate, you'll be in an area infested with harpies and filled with those dream crystals. There are several you can find, only one is necessary for the main quest you're doing at this point, but one of the many optional crystals will show you a dwarven nightmare. Viewing that specific crystal will kick off a new side quest, Baltimore's Nightmare, and it's this quest you need to complete in a specific way in order to get all the possible concrete evidence for the Stennis investigation. This side quest will take you to the very same Thorak. It turns out he recently replaced his master, Baltimore, who mysteriously disappeared. To make a long story very short, you find various notes from Baltimore that lead you on a wild goose chase all across Vergen, before you eventually find the master's old hideout where there's a set of notes incriminating Thorak. He murdered Baltimore so he could take his position, status, and home. Now this dwarf can get out of the quest alive if you agree to let him take the notes before you've actually read them, and in return he'll give you a permanent discount at his shop. If you don't agree to this proposition, he dies, and that was the side quest decision I briefly mentioned earlier. I do not think Geralt would just step aside and let Thorak take the evidence, because it's very clear he was involved in his master's disappearance before you've even read the notes. So why is any of this important to the Stennis investigation other than the shared character of Thorak? Well, if you do the investigation while Thorak is alive, meaning you either haven't completed absolutely everything I just described, or you have completed all of it but made a deal with Thorak and let him live, when you try to look into his possible connection to the replica Saskia Chalice, he will just deny any involvement. Saskia's goblet. Was that your handiwork? That ugly bucket! Did you intend to offend me? Whoever made that thing should be whipped! However, if you complete everything and you also get the ending of Baltimore's Nightmare where you kill him, you'll have in your possession a key that you looted off of Thorak's body. What does this key allow you to open? Well, once you talk to the dwarf who made Saskia's original goblet, you'll get the same quest you usually do, but with a different objective. Find a lock that fits Thorak's key. In his home, you'll find a small chest, and inside of it you'll find a note specifically written from Olcan, the priest, to Thorak. It fully incriminates both the priest and the dwarf in the poisoning of Saskia, with absolutely no room for doubt. The only question is, what about Stennis specifically? At this point, after completing both quests, it's time to make your judgment. You know for a fact that Olcan was the primary individual involved in Saskia's poisoning. He both planned out and commissioned a fake goblet, and his note to Thorak leaves no room for doubt in his intentions. You also know from using Axie on the servant that the priest requested that Stennis clear out the kitchen of any servants. You don't know if Stennis actually fulfilled that request, but you do know that Olcan's plan ultimately succeeded. You also know from conversations you can have before the attempted lynching that Stennis flat out refuses to give you a drop of his blood which is needed as part of the cure for Saskia. And that is still true even if you axie his guards and speak to him while the lynch mob is outside. And I'll certainly not surrender even a drop of royal blood to save a peasant girl. Gods! During this conversation, Stennis even tries to bribe Geralt to prove his innocence by any means necessary. It is possible to talk to Stennis, the Chalice Dwarf, and the Servant before the mob gets fed up, so I think it's fair game to include all of it in Geralt's evidence. So after all that, when the mob is ready for blood, Stennis will come out of his quarters and immediately start being a pompous ass to the mob who wants to lynch him. Is a prince a common thief who steals a dozen eggs at the market? You stand before royal majesty and you raise your hands against it. Now, despite everything that took us up to this point, one fact still remains. Geralt doesn't have any concrete evidence that Stennis himself was involved in the poisoning. He's probably guilty and Geralt has a ton of circumstantial stuff, but nothing he can point to that's anything close to actual serious proof of Stennis' involvement. It doesn't matter though, because you have to make a decision. Do you let this mob brutally kill Stennis as their intentions are made very clear, or do you quell the mob and have Stennis taken into custody? Well, regardless of the fact that I very much do not like Stennis, and I personally think he was involved, I do not think Geralt would step aside and let the mob kill him. 
What's more is that your choice to let them do so goes much further than Geralt just letting it happen. If you choose to allow a lynching, Geralt not only lets them do it, but he pushes the crowd into it and even eggs them on once it begins. I really can't imagine anything less Geralt-like. Some of that dialogue is very off and honestly feels disconnected from where the conversation was going when you weren't making dialogue choices. Having Stennis taken into custody is the Geralt thing to do here. Geralt wouldn't encourage a lynching even if you had rock-solid proof, let alone in this scenario. Believe me, I know that Stennis going into custody is not a neat and tidy outcome. Stennis has far too many connections for it to be expected that he's held for long. But letting this mob kill a possibly innocent man is the greater evil here. Yes, yes, I know, I'd rather not choose at all, but the Witcher series is all about being forced to make those decisions, even if you'd rather not. What will happen if we allow a lynching? What if people see that might makes right? Who'll guarantee they won't desire to avenge their wrongs? real and imagined. That is it for meaningful choices in Act 2 on the Yorvith path. There really are very few, I mean there's the Dun Banner Ghost you can either fool or kill, which also pops up on Roach's side of things, but that's more you having to answer trivia questions and if you get them wrong, you have to fight, so that doesn't really fit. Let's just jump over to the Roach path and then it's not going to be long before we're in Act 3, where everything we set up comes tumbling down. Only one of the side quests on Roach's version of Act 2 has a proper decision attached to it. And then we also have what is likely the toughest main quest decision in the entire game. So the side quest I'm talking about is Little Sisters. This quest can be a bit confusing, partially by design. While exploring Henselt's camp, you happen to witness a soldier with an unfortunate haircut getting bullied. If you speak to him, you'll learn that his name is Maverick. And a while back, poor Maverick saw a ghost, which led to a chain reaction in his pants. No other way to put this. I shit myself. Out of fear. Pants right full by the time I got back to camp. Since then, they mock me. Call me the Crapper. Maverick wants you to eliminate this ghost, and surprisingly, this quest you get from a guy nicknamed the Crapper has a ton of depth and can actually be a bit difficult to wrap your head around, at least the finer details of it. Before heading to the nearby beach hut where he says he saw this ghost, you can first speak to a medic at the local brothel. She has some backstory on the place, and you learn from her that a man named Malgit and his three children used to live there. Malgit was a healer, and three years ago, while he was tending to wounded soldiers, someone killed his children. The healer then committed suicide in despair. Once you make your way out to where this happened, you'll find a gravesite for Malgit and his three children, as well as a hidden cellar filled with some questionable looking totems and a secret room you can unlock. Inside, you'll find some notes written in an unknown language. These notes aren't actually relevant to the mystery of this quest specifically, but this room's existence is important. So, at this point, if you were paying close attention to the Crapper's words, you'll know that the spirit he allegedly came into contact with can only be found at night. And if you wait it out, she turns out to be real, and you can speak to her. You're not the one we seek, though his aura is strong, even on you. Impossible. I watched Maverick wash his pants. It also turns out that this isn't just one spirit you're dealing with, but three. The spokeswoman for the spirits will claim that Maverick is no innocent, and that he's actually the one who killed them, as they are the children of Malgit, the healer who committed suicide. Fortunately, fate has brought Maverick here again, straight into our hands. Revenge shall be ours. Now at this point, you can either choose to kill the spirits or tell them you need to look into things further. The weird part of this quest is that choosing to investigate more than you already have locks you into a specific path with mostly bad endings and the good one requires you to do something I don't think Geralt would do. Here's what I mean. The only new option you have after speaking to the spirit is going back to Maverick, and the only new information you get from him is that he had apparently heard that the healer, Malgit, conspired with river demons. At this point, you have two options with Maverick. Lie and trick him to take him to the spirit, or immediately get a bit accusatory and say that the sisters think he's a murderer, which at this point you have no evidence for. That said, the second option is the one that makes a bit more sense than just taking him to the spirit, but if you make that choice and tell him what the sisters are claiming he did, Maverick tells you, justifiably in my opinion, to screw off. Why are you believing what these evil spirits are telling you? Unfortunately, you can't speak to him after this, and if you visit the beach again, you find him brutally murdered. The other option of tricking Maverick leads to him immediately agreeing to help, and once you have the spirits and Maverick together, the good news is that it's not just a sacrifice you're forced into. The spokeswoman spirit will then surprise you by addressing Maverick as her brother, which is something he doesn't react to. Kiss my arse, Phantom. 
You'll not make me shit myself this time. You can then choose to either let the spirits have him or try to get more information. If you try to press him for details, even with the spirits right there breathing down his neck, Maverick sticks to his story. He's just a soldier, he says. You then have to make a choice. There's no getting out of this. Help Maverick fight the spirits or let the spirits have him. You can't prove your innocence, and somehow you neglected to mention they were your sisters. They themselves are proof of your crime. They're dead. I leave him to you. How could you betray me? I trusted you! Now where am I going with this? Where does the what does Geralt do part come in? If you're deeply familiar with this quest, you might even be writing out a 300 page dissertation in the comments on how I'm a moron who missed what's actually going on here. Please feel free to hit submit on that comment because I'd be happy to read your unhinged rant. So back to what's actually going on. The only way you're getting anything close to the full story here is if you make some very questionable decisions. And the choice I think Geralt would make means you get almost no information. The reason I say that is because everyone and everything is either lying to you or giving you bad information in this quest. Almost nothing you are told is true. Maverick is lying about just being a soldier who visited a beach and saw a ghost. The brothel medic story about a father killing himself after his daughters were murdered is 100% wrong. And the spirits are also attempting to deceive you. The only thing you can trust in this quest until the very end is your intuition and ability to see holes in everyone's story. Even when the spirits are about to kill Maverick and he's begging for you to not let it happen, he's still not telling the full truth. Here's the real story, which you'll only ever get if you pay extremely close attention to the physical evidence around the house, and you also play through this quest several times over, because each ending provides little pieces of real information. So, Maverick is the brother of the murdered sisters, but he didn't kill them. He's also really a soldier, but he was stationed at his old family home, this hut, years ago. It isn't just a hut on a beach to him, and when he visited this place in the recent event that led to him earning his nickname, it was because these spirits had been tormenting him for years, trying to lure him back, but he got away a few pounds lighter. It wasn't just a chance event as he initially claimed when you first met. The sisters were murdered, but the culprit was neither Maverick or a soldier that snuck in while their father was tending to the wounded, which is what the brothel medic told you. They were actually murdered by Malgut, their father and the healer. One of the soldiers had shamed his children, as Maverick puts it in one of the endings, and Malgut killed all of them in disgust, sacrificing them to the river demon he worshipped. The purpose of the cellar below the house is to get across the idea that Malgut might not be the innocent healer you think he is. Malgut didn't kill himself either. Maverick, his son, who wasn't there when his siblings were killed, found his father with blood on his hands. They fought, and according to Maverick, he fell off a cliff. Whether he intentionally killed his father or not is something you can't be sure of, but it doesn't really matter. Switching gears a little bit, the spokeswoman's sister you get all your information from also has another big secret. She isn't actually one of the dead sisters. No, who you're actually speaking to is the river demon who multiplied one of the sister's souls and is speaking through that copied spirit to try and fool Maverick, or anyone naive enough to bring Maverick back to the beach. Why is she trying to fool people using a copied spirit and not just speaking through one of the sisters? Well, there is a third child that was killed, just not a third daughter. Malgut also had a son he sacrificed, a son named Muron, who the demon tried to corrupt but was unable to. But his brothers proved too resistant, and I was forced to try. The two spirits that are with this demon are the actual sisters, and from what I can tell, they're not evil themselves, they're just corrupted by and subservient to this river demon. The whole motivation to all of this is simply that the demon has the sisters, and now she wants Maverick, as the other brother spirit resisted her or it. Even in the ending where you get the most information, which is when you trick Maverick but question him and then kill the spirit, you still only get a third of the story because Maverick is just confused and wants to go home. He doesn't know why there are three female specters instead of two, or why they want him dead. He doesn't even know that the talking spirit is the demon his father worshipped. He also never even mentions his brother, it's up to you to piece that together. It's kind of incredible how this quest takes such care to keep in mind what each character would actually know, and more importantly, what they would want to say. On that subject, what does Geralt know, when does he know it, and how does that determine what choice he would make? I just explained the true story by getting every single piece of real information from each of the half dozen iterations of this quest, but Geralt is never going to have all of that info. Well, to back way up, I do not think Geralt would lie and trick Maverick at all. Yes, that does lead to you getting the most information, but it's a really horrible thing to do to this guy. You have absolutely no reason to believe that he's the murderer. From the get-go, this demon pretending to be one of the sisters has a story that doesn't sound right, and other than her accusation, you have nothing on him. 
Keep in mind, Geralt is a witcher, this is his profession, and there's one big clue that is very easy to miss as a player that immediately tells you that the Demon Sisters story is bullshit. In the graveyard outside the hut, which I mentioned earlier, there are four graves. If you inspect each and every one, you're meant to notice that one of the children's graves is very clearly marked with a male name, yet somehow there are three sister spirits. The demon calls you out on falling for this if you give Maverick up to her. Odd that you never noticed Maverick had only two sisters and not three. I think Geralt would just kill the spirit outright and move on. The demon also very clearly says it wants to kill Maverick, there's no peaceful solution, and I just don't see Geralt tricking him and bringing him there with no evidence, and quite frankly, even if he did have evidence this being is so clearly evil, I don't know how much that even matters. This isn't a succubus situation. Geralt isn't bringing Maverick to this evil entity who clearly wants revenge against a living person. You can also find a dead body on the beach not far from where the spirit is found, which should also be sending up red flags. It is a bit ironic that this is the ending where Geralt ends up with the least amount of information because Maverick just gives you the reward and moves on, but this is how I think Geralt would play it. It's a really weird quest from a player perspective, because when you're first presented with the option to kill or investigate more, it's obvious that the spirit is lying, but it's also clear there's more to this story, even if you notice the male gravestone. As a player, you probably want more of the story, which is either going to result in you finding Maverick dead because you pissed him off, or you tricking him, which doesn't feel morally correct. So, believe it or not, that is the only real choice you have to make during the Hensalt camp section of the game. Of course, you still have a lot of freedom in the order you do things, who you happen to speak to, whether you have money and want to bribe people or progress certain plot points via other methods, but as far as big moral decisions, that's it until you've left the camp. There are just two more choices in Roach's version of Act 2, both of which take place when you're back in Vergen. After that, it's on to Act 3, where the dominoes fall and the game is throwing huge moral dilemmas at you every five minutes. So, both of these final Act 2 decisions are kill or spare situations. The first is very straightforward. As you're traveling through a hidden passage into Vergen, Geralt and Roach will run into Henselt's sorcerer, Deathmold. He's accompanied by a group of mercenaries led by Adam Pangrat, a book character who also appears in The Witcher 2. These guys are soldiers for hire, serving whoever pays them the most, and in this case, they were contracted by Henselt to guard the perimeter of the Cursed Mist before Geralt lifted that curse. While in Henselt's camp, you can speak to Pangrat pretty extensively and even arm wrestle the guy. Let's talk arm wrestling. So back to the present situation, Deathmold attacks and it's an all out brawl. You and Roach versus Deathmold, Pangrat, and all of his men. Deathmold eventually flees after you've killed everyone else, apparently, but as it turns out, there is one other survivor, Pangrat. He's very wounded and says he won't beg for mercy, but if you spare him, he'll stay out of your way. I feel pretty confident in saying that Geralt wouldn't kill Pangrat here. He's extremely wounded, is absolutely no threat to you, Deathmold thinks he's dead so he's no longer in anyone's service, and at the end of the day, he's not really your enemy. He's just a mercenary who takes coin in exchange for what he does best. If you spare the guy, he gives you a sword upgrade and he and Roach have a nice little chat. Next time, choose your missions more carefully. Perhaps it's time to rest. Got a woman in Tredegar. Julia. She's expecting. You knocked up pretty kitty. Oh, congratulations, Pangrat. And give him my regards. So the situation with Pangrat was a good setup for what comes next. About 10 minutes after that, as you continue into Vergen, you'll find yourself alone with the King of Kedwin, Henselt. He ordered his men to kill you, and once you've wiped them out, you have to choose whether the King lives or dies. Roach wants blood, and you can either let whatever happens happen, or step in between them. Why does Roach want Henselt dead so bad? Well, you probably know, but in case you don't or need a refresh, just before you left for Vergen, the two of you returned to Henselt's camp together, and you find that all of Roach's men, the Blue Stripes, are dead. Henselt had them hanged because he found out Roach was involved in a conspiracy against him, although none of the other Blue Stripes were even in on it. The only survivor is Roach's right-hand woman, Vess. Now, the game communicates this next part in a very weird way, but in addition to having Roach's men killed, Henselt also forced himself onto Vess. You, the player, learn this outright in a little flashback, and Geralt realizes that Vess is withholding information and has his suspicions, but Roach doesn't come close to figuring things out until later when you're alone with Henselt. However, even before Roach learns about what happened to Vess, he has no intentions of letting the slaughter of his men go without retaliation. Everything I loved died in this tent. My country disintegrates, my friends cruelly murdered. I want blood. So flash forward to shortly after this and where we were. 
You're in Vergen, and through what is kind of a chance encounter, it's not exactly planned, you find yourself alone with the King of Kedwin. He had just set his men on you, and despite the fact that you wiped all of them out with ease, Henselt immediately begins gloating even after Roach has entered the room. The King seems to think that Roach won't actually kill him because he's too important to touch, but Roach disagrees with that take on the situation. After a couple of minutes of gloating over his genius in taking the Dwarven City, Henselt orders you to reason with Roach, but before you make your decision, in a disgusting and over-the-top fashion, Henselt confirms Geralt's suspicions about what happened with Vess, and drops that news on an oblivious Roach for the first time. Now this might be my most controversial take of the video, but I think after that, Geralt says screw it, do what you want Roach. Just putting myself in his head at that moment, it's how I feel things would go down, although I definitely won't claim it's an overwhelming certainty. I do know that Geralt has a tipping point. In fact, there's a somewhat similar situation in The Witcher 3 where I think that point is reached as well. Even though this one isn't a time decision, how it plays out is not one where, after that statement about Vess, Geralt is thinking about the long-term political consequences of Henselt's death. Of course, even if he was, there are huge pros and cons there, too. Leaving Henselt alive is very bad for Geralt and Roach, as Roach points out if you tell him to leave Henselt alone. This king is a petty one, he will have men on you until you're found. With Henselt dead, even though the king claims his men will find you, what happens in that room can stay there. No one knows you're alone with him. The big con to Henselt dying is that it isn't great for the stability of the North, although The Witcher 3 shows it doesn't end up mattering anyway. At any rate, I don't think Geralt is particularly concerned with any of that in the moment, especially after what Henselt had to say. This all happens within hours of finding every last one of Roach's men hanged on Henselt's orders. The shock of that is still very fresh, and then this idiot king can't help but gloat about what a tactical genius he is, and follows that up by bragging about what he did to Vess. I do think this situation could very realistically play out either way, but I'm sticking to Geralt letting Roach do what he wants. This is a tough choice, and it's one that the game does not attempt to make you question your judgment about either way you go. Killing him is framed in a very satisfying way, and of course The Witcher 3 runs with Roach having killed him as the way things played out. If you don't simulate a save, the default status is that Roach killed him, and if you do simulate a save, Roach still killed him. You don't get to set that choice. The only way to have the game consider the other option is if you import a save on PC where you spared the guy, in which case you get a one-line explanation where you're told Henselt just died immediately after the events of The Witcher 2 anyway. King Henselt fought on the front line as always, and that is where he died. Is this a consequence of the writers preferring Henselt dead at Roach's hand, or is it simply because having him out of the way is easier? Trying to account for him with the political situation of The Witcher 3 certainly would have been a challenge, so they just have him die even if you let him live. Now with Henselt out of the way, that does wrap up Act 2 and takes us to Act 3. Flotsam was where we set things up, the second act is more of a transition with a few very complex choices, and Act 3 is where everything comes crashing down in the ruined city of Loch Muin. Most of these decisions are the ones that are actually accounted for moving forward into The Witcher 3. This final act is very straightforward, the big heavy hitter choices all show up in rapid succession during the main quest. There is some side content, but the decisions are all kind of meta and are based on you, the player, not messing things up, much like the Dunbanner trivia I mentioned earlier. Realistically, Act 3 is all about the big four. One after another, you have to make huge choices, so instead of dawdling around with meta questions like, would Geralt want to respec his skill points? Let's just cut to the chase. All of the big choices you face in the final act are shared between both paths with some key differences. We'll start with the Yorvith version of the first choice. Shortly after arriving in the city in pursuit of Triss, Letho, and the sorceress Sheila de Tanzerville, you find yourself at a crossroads in a prison below ground. You're finally close to Triss, but she's in more danger than ever before. Nilfgaardians have her captured and, in all likelihood, are torturing her for information on the Lodge of Sorceresses, of which she's a member. You also know that once they have that information, Triss is very expendable and will be killed, something Shillard Fitz Esterlin, a higher-ranking Nilfgaardian, tells you outright. Let Triss go. That would be foolish. If there truly is a place we go after leaving this Vale of Tears, you'll meet her there soon enough. The good news is that Triss is very nearby, like a five-minute walk, and Geralt has exactly what he needs to rescue her. In this prison, he incapacitates Shillard to use as a hostage and meat shield if need be. Move your ass, Excellency. To back up just a moment, there's a decision you need to take care of before making use of your hostage. In this same prison, you'll also find Philippa Eilhart, who is having a below-average day. She's being held in a cell for one of her many crimes and has a unique proposal for you. 
Break her out and she'll show you a way to undo a curse that she herself placed on Saskia. Take these shackles off me and lead me to my house. I beg you. Just a reminder, Saskia is this girl who also happens to be a dragon. Philippa, ever the opportunist, enslaved her mind when Saskia was in a coma after being poisoned. Now, the decision that needs to be made is whether you save Triss or believe Philippa, let her out of her cell, and attempt to lift Saskia's curse. In my mind, it's a certainty that Geralt rescues Triss here. If nothing else, she's definitely a dear friend, and the Nilfgaardians could kill her any minute. It's also worth pointing out that even in this very conversation, just before you have to make your choice, Geralt is saying things like this. Shillard said they've got Triss. I have to free her before they put out her eyes, too. Going to the Nilfgaardian camp is suicide. And leaving a friend is villainy. That's not a dialogue decision by the player. Geralt says that no matter what. I just don't see Geralt abandoning Triss and leaving her to potentially die, regardless of the fact that at this point he is a bit more aware that Triss maybe wasn't sharing all that she knew. In fact, there's actually a great little exchange about exactly that once you do rescue her. I never lied to you. I just didn't tell you everything. How is that not lying? Geralt is gonna go rescue a friend or loved one in imminent danger no matter what, within the bounds of reason. I mean, swap Triss with Dandelion or Vesemir or Yennefer or Ciri once his memory is restored. Would Geralt really leave them to die? I don't think so. While curing Saskia is something Geralt would like to do, it's not quite as immediate of a situation, even though, don't get me wrong, I fully understand how important it is. Geralt even says in the epilogue that Saskia can still be cured and they should try and break it. If Triss dies, well, there's no undoing that. Geralt would never forgive himself, and it's a very real and immediate possibility even if it doesn't happen. Now, the other variation of this decision also includes saving Triss as one of your options. With Roach, instead of needing to decide between Triss and an attempt at lifting a curse, your second option is instead helping Roach rescue Foltest's daughter, Anais, from a Kedweni camp. He's going for it with or without you, but if you want, you can help. Anais is very important politically, but I don't think I need to over-explain the political situation to say that again, Geralt is probably going for Triss here. Roach knows it, and there's several moments of dialogue where he clearly understands that you have different priorities in the moment. I absolutely love Roach and Geralt's dynamic, I wish we got more of it in The Witcher 3, because they have such a unique understanding of each other. Also, similar to the Yorvis side, there are multiple scripted moments just before this decision where Geralt is making clear that his priority is Triss, and that he knows just how dire the situation is. The Emperor's men hold Triss. They'll get everything they can out of her, after which she'll be dispensable. I will say, I do sort of dislike that you even have to make this choice. I'm not normally bothered by the passage of time in gameplay compared to the story when it doesn't quite add up, but this situation is an extreme example. During this very cutscene where Roach is telling you to figure out your next move, Without over-explaining things, I'll just say that a woman comes up to you requesting an escort way outside the city. Roach will ask you to take care of it while he does a bit of reconnaissance. It's totally optional, but you can do this quest, which is tied to the rescue of Anais, leave the city for many hours, I mean in-game it must be at least half a day, and then return and rescue Anais just fine, he'll wait all that time for you. Unfortunately though, you can't skip the optional escort, go rescue Triss, which takes all of 20 minutes, and then go help Roach after that. To be fair, that rescue mission was added later as part of the Enhanced Edition, but I think the placement is very much not ideal because it makes that choice between helping Roach and rescuing Triss feel very unnecessary. Now, before I move on to the next big decision you need to make, I should quickly mention that if you do leave Triss to the Nilfgaardians, while helping Roach you can make a judgement call on whether you let Roach take Anais to Radovid, or convince him to take her to the Temerian delegation in the city, led by John Natalis. Diving too deep into this choice would require a 90 minute breakdown of the political situation in the north, so I'll just say that I think Geralt would definitely talk Roach out of bringing Anais to Radovid. Dishonored I'll be no one. Not in Temeria, not anywhere else. Natalis it is. Come child, I'll take you to a safe place. So our final three choices all happen to be kill or spare decisions, although I guess this first one is more let die or save. You find yourself alone in a tower with Sheila de Tanzerville. Now, Sheila is a pretty awful person who isn't quite as talented as Philippa in being a master manipulator, and I'd also argue that she isn't quite as evil as Philippa either. Realistically, Sheila just gets played over and over again throughout the events of The Witcher 2, but that certainly hasn't gained her any sympathy from Geralt's perspective. At this point in the story, Geralt only knows that Sheila commissioned Letho to slay King Demavend, a weak ruler whose death put the Lodge of Sorceresses in a position to gain more power over the North. He also suspects that Sheila was involved in the assassination of Foltest as well as the failed attempt on Henselt. However, before this upcoming decision to potentially save Sheila, she reveals that the Lodge had nothing to do with those other assassinations. 
Letho, who was working for Nilfgaard the entire time, was acting on the Emperor's orders to sow chaos in the north by slaying kings, and Sheila asking him to take out Demavend was her playing right into his hands. He lied to everyone. Me, Yorveth, your stupid little Triss, and you. So at this point, Sheila begins to teleport away, but there's a problem. Someone placed a flawed diamond in her megascope, which is interfering with her spell. She begs you to remove the diamond, as if you don't, she'll be torn apart, which admittedly, is very satisfying. No! No! That animation reminds me of what happens when you kill rot fiends. In fact, it might even be the same exact one. Anyway, make no mistake about this situation, Sheila does suck. She's awful, and the Lodge, Philippa in particular, have little regard for the lives of anyone they deem beneath them, which is almost everyone. Sheila also knows it's likely Geralt dies after she leaves, as Philippa is in control of Sethensis, or Saskia, who will be used to burn the remains of the ruined city once Sheila is safely out of it. Although, to be fair, Geralt has survived far more dire situations, so his death isn't a certainty. It's also worth mentioning that as you chase Sheila before this encounter, she is hesitant to kill you. So, I think that's all the necessary context. Sheila is going to explode in a moment if you don't reach your hand out and remove the flawed diamond. Now, as satisfying as the alternative is, I do believe Geralt would save Sheila here. In the Henselt situation, which I am very split on but ultimately lean towards death, I see that as one of the exceptions and not the rule. Generally, I don't think Geralt sees himself as an arbiter of who gets to live or die, but especially in a situation like this where the person is helpless. Now, if you do save Sheila, she's grateful and gives you some Yennefer information. Should you survive, go south to Nilfgaard where you'll find Yennefer of Vengerberg. Farewell, Witcher. Of course, if you did spare Sheila, her ultimate fate is worse, but in the moment, you don't know that she'll be one of the unlucky sorceresses who gets captured. It's actually a beautiful bit of writing when you run into her again in The Witcher 3. Geralt offers to end her suffering because she's not going to live otherwise, and they have a little moment that's really impactful when you think about how different this situation is from the last time you saw Sheila. Funny. There was a time... I'd have asked you not to do this. No, you'd never have asked. You're too proud. Despite Sheila being not a great person, it's very difficult to see anyone go from this to this. To move on though, whether you spared Sheila or let her burst, it's time to stop the dragon from burning the remains of the city and any stragglers still inside of it. You fight for a bit, ultimately get the upper hand, and come crashing down in a forest, where the dragon slash Saskia slash the Thensesis is impaled. Now, there are three variations to what comes next, but one of them doesn't involve a choice. If you opted to leave Triss and trust Philippa, you'll have in your possession a dagger to cure Saskia right there and then. In that case, there's no choice here, it just happens automatically. Otherwise, you're in another kill or spare situation, and the context is very different depending on whether you went to Vergen or Henselt's camp in Act 2. If you were with Yorveth in Vergen, you know that Sethensis, this dragon, is Saskia. If you were with Roach, well, you just know that it's a dragon that Philippa has some level of control over. Now, there's a unique element to this decision that I sort of need to remove from the equation before moving forward. I would argue that on a first-time playthrough, this choice can come off as if it's a mercy kill situation. I'm not an expert on vital organ placement in dragons, but when Saskia gets impaled by this tree, it doesn't look good. However, despite how it looks, it actually isn't a let the dragon suffer or put it out of its misery decision. It really is kill or spare. I'm jumping around a bit to make this point, but after you've made your choice, whether you let the dragon live or not, Geralt makes it clear that he knew she was going to survive even though he walks away immediately after either way. On the Yorvith path, if you killed her, Geralt's reasoning for why isn't that she was going to die from her injuries, but that if he'd let her go, she'd still be under Philippa's control. When you let her live, regardless of the context, Geralt always mentions that she'll recover. The only exception, and it's very strange, is if you kill her on the Roach path when you chose to help him save Anais over saving Triss. In that case, when you meet up with Roach again, Geralt does act like it was a mercy kill, which doesn't really add up with what he says in any of the other aftermaths of his decision. I suppose it doesn't really matter, The Witcher 2 does that sometimes, where if you compare what is said between different decisions in the exact same situation, it's not quite consistent, but... It kind of muddies the water of this choice if you're looking at it as a mercy kill. To get that part out of the way, I'll say that if Geralt was looking at it as an act of mercy, like this dragon is for sure going to die and you walking away just means it will suffer, then sure, he'd put an end to that because why wouldn't he? However, in the majority of cases, the aftermath isn't treated that way at all, so let's say that Geralt knows this dragon will recover. Does he still kill her? Well, on the Yorvis side of things where he knows she's Saskia, I'd definitely say no. 
Beyond the fact that Saskia is sort of his friend and Geralt thinks she can still be cured, Geralt doesn't kill dragons. This is something that is said in the books and many times over in The Witcher 2, even early on in the prologue. Is it true you witches don't hunt dragons? Mm -hmm. I should say, I'm definitely not denying that there's logic in taking Sethensis out while you have the chance. The idea of Philippa with a dragon, even a very injured one, is scary. Still, I don't think any of that would outweigh Geralt's convictions here, and honestly, even on the Roach Path where you don't know this dragon is Saskia, I still think Geralt walks away. Not killing dragons is one of Geralt's only rules that his life has actually allowed him to stick to, and I don't see that changing here. The last thing I want to do is slaughter one of the most beautiful creatures I've ever seen. Now, that was the end of the third act, and what comes next is the epilogue, and with it, the big final showdown between Letho and Geralt. It's all been leading up to this, but first you need some answers, which turns into a big 30 minute conversation where you realize just how skillfully Letho played the Lodge, and that at the end of the day he was just a pawn himself in the Emperor's plan to sow chaos in the North. I'm just gonna cut to the chase with this one, I don't think Geralt kills Letho. Keep in mind, Letho had a chance to kill Geralt in Flotsam. He didn't. You even come to find out that he did you a very big solid in the past in taking care of Amnesiac Yennefer while she recovered. And similar to Geralt, she was behaving just like her old self despite not having any of her memories. Well, the woman turned out to be quite a character. Throwing temper tantrums. Trying to seduce orcs. Letho is also the only reason that Triss doesn't die if you leave her to the Nilfgaardians, as he rescues her from the camp himself. Most importantly though, this is the end of a very long journey for Geralt and the beginning of another. His memories have finally returned in full, Letho just wants to go his own way, and I don't see Geralt going for revenge on a fellow Witcher at this point. It was never anything personal, Geralt just got caught in the middle of everything when Letho slayed Foltest, and there's very little point in killing him here other than a need for vengeance. I also think Geralt's reaction when you tell Letho to leave just perfectly sums up the situation. It's this gesture of, just get out of here, I don't want to look at your face, and I can't believe how stupid all of this was. So, it's time for an important question. What did you think of this video, and would you like to see this concept applied to The Witcher 3? I have never made a video this long, so maybe it's an unwatchable mess, I don't know, but what I do know is that I had a lot of fun making this one, even though I must have sunk 100 hours into it. That said, if you do enjoy Witcher content, I'd love if you subscribed, and leaving a like would also be appreciated, as it does help get these videos out there and to an audience. Anyway, thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next one.